Thank you for having me here today. I'm sorry I can't be present in person, but I am very grateful that I have a chance to present my story to you. It's the story of my data and me. In 2009, I was diagnosed with inflammatory breast cancer. Afterward, as all cancer patients do, the focus was on recovering my health. I engaged in a formal exercise program at the hospital. I continued that program on my own after it ended. At work, I had an upstairs office, so I'd go up and down the stairs at the office several times a day just for a little cardio. And I have a home and 4.5 acres that I had to keep up. So I had plenty of things to do to get me back in shape. The problem was I wasn't getting better and better as time went by. I wasn't recovering. Instead, I was declining. If I pushed on, uh, anyway, I would get symptoms that were hard to make sense of and hard to manage. The doctors didn't seem to believe when I would tell them what was happening. They'd run their little tests, and I always passed them. Then they'd enter the normal test results into my chart, as well as their judgment that I was, of course, perfectly fine. I knew that they were wrong. I didn't care what their test said. I lived in this body, and I knew something was amiss. For seven or eight years after my cancer treatments ended, I began to become an expert at faking it. I sought answers from various medical specialists, but nobody had any ideas about what was going on. And every time they would put into my electronic record that I had good health. So I'd go back to work where I would start, I had started struggling to climb the stairs to my office. And at home, things slowly fell into disrepair because I was simply unable to find the energy and endurance to take care of stuff. One day after several years of this had gone by, I thought, this is ridiculous. They say I'm fine. I've got to start acting like I'm fine, and maybe I really will start feeling better. So I decided to take on one chore that was a desperate need of being done, and that's to cut down some saplings on my perk field. I used my little chainsaw, and predictably enough, within five to ten minutes, my heart was racing, I was breathing very rapidly, but I felt oxygen starved. My muscles were weak and burning, as if I had been running a marathon. I was weak and tired, but I pushed onward, because after all, I was healthy, wasn't I? That's what my electronic health record said. I was wrong. I wasn't healthy. I was so weak and so tired, but I kept pressing on. The chainsaw kicked back suddenly and I cut my thigh. Uh, it's the only time in a decade of using this chainsaw that I ever had a mishap with it. If the accident had been worse, if it had kicked back and hit me in the neck, I could have died. So I was clearly not healthy, but it was just a clear to me that I was on my own with everything. In March of 2016, I had a cardiopulmonary stress test courtesy of a pulmonologist I had consulted. Predictably enough, I pushed to give it my best effort, and in the end, I was declared perfectly healthy. By the time I got home, however, the old symptoms were starting to set in. This time, though, a doctor knew exactly how much energy I'd just expended, and I thought maybe they'd take my symptoms seriously now. So I reported using the patient portal on my electronic health record, told my doctor exactly what was happening, what my symptoms were. 20 or 30 minutes later, I sent her another message saying that the symptoms were unabated and, in fact, had been exacerbated with new ones. I was keenly aware, however, that while I might get this one doctor's attention, what would that mean in the long run? None of this was going into my official health record that would be consulted by the next doctors who opened my chart. It was just a private communication between this one doctor and me. There was no way for this to be tracked as relevant data. I did get the doctor's attention that evening. She called me at home three times trying to get me to go to the emergency room. I said, no, I'm not going. This is not a heart attack. I've been down this road. I know it's not a heart attack. So she looked at my exercise test results one more time, found a tiny anomaly, and said, maybe there is a problem with your heart's stroke volume. So I promised her that I would consult with a cardiologist. And indeed I did. I consulted with two different cardiologists in two different hospital systems in two different states, which means two sets of testing, two sets of expenses. Cardiologist number one said, maybe I had a little bit of left ventricular hypertrophy. In other words, old lady's heart. It's not really very important. 
Cardiologist number two at a very highly regarded cardiology clinic in the U.S. said, there is nothing wrong with your heart. In fact, you have the heart of someone 10 to 15 years younger. In other words, no answers. Still, I was officially fine. A friend suggested I might have sleep apnea. I knew I didn't because I'd already had a test for it, but he said I should buy a pulse oximeter, and I did. I found out that my oxygen levels were fine, in fact, quite good, but my heart rate had changed compared to what it was immediately after my cancer treatments. My resting heart rate was noticeably higher, and my working heart rate had changed dramatically. I took this information to the doctors, and they said, eh. After all, my heart rate was fine when I was in their office, and if they had anything to say about it, it was, well, you're getting older after all. Another friend asked me what my blood pressure was doing during these episodes when I had these symptoms, so I went shopping. I bought a wrist BP cuff, and I noted that post-exertion, my BP was quite a bit lower than normal, and my heart rate was quite a bit higher. When I took this information to my doctor, she said, eh, wrist cuffs are not very accurate. So I went shopping again. This time I bought an arm BP cuff. Same results, same readings, same reaction from the doctor. In fact, she wasn't convinced that these measurements were really meaningful because they were probably cheap and inaccurate cuffs because they were available to the consumer. So I took both cuffs to the doctor's office and calibrated them against the doctor's equipment. All three cuffs were within a couple of points of one another. So my instruments were accurate. The doctor said, well, this is just a couple of weird one-off readings. This is not important. I, however, felt that it was quite important. So I began a dedicated program of sequential, every few minutes, instrumented health data collection. I would do this during times when I was having symptoms. I would during, do this during times when I didn't have any particular symptoms. I'd check various factors like my O2 sats, my blood sugar, my heart rate. I bought new instruments to get extra data. I bought a Cardia mobile EKG monitor, and I bought a Fitbit. Compared, I compared all of this data to the baseline data gathered in the Cancer Survivors Exercise Program, and I recorded all of this data in various places in various ways. The result was data invisibility and asymmetry. None of this data that I was collecting was entered into my official electronic health record. There wasn't any place in there for patient furnished data. All I could do was communicate it piecemeal to my doctors. This meant that whatever I contributed was fated to remain in the invisible realm of private communications. The result was data asymmetry. I could, sooner or later, see the lab and imaging results that my doctors contributed to my health record, which made up the health profile other doctors and nurses would see. They, however, could not see all the real-time data I was trying to contribute to the picture. Therefore, I was the only one with the synoptic, global view of the problem. No surprise, then, that I was the one who finally got some kind of handle on what was going on. What I discovered on my own is that when I exerted myself, for a few minutes, my heart, lungs, and blood vessels would work together to respond to the demand I was making of them and keep me moving, just like they're supposed to do. But within a few minutes, my blood pressure would start to crash. I could lose 20 or 30 points of blood pressure in just two to three minutes, and my heart rate would, of course, rise in order to try to offset that quick drop. The closer the numbers for my blood pressure and my heart rate got, the worse and worse I'd feel. In addition, it felt like my breathing could never come fast and deep enough to give me the oxygen I needed at such times. It was scary and, and uh, quite miserable. My friend Nancy is the one who had alerted me to the fact that I might have inflammatory breast cancer. She saved me again now. I was exercising with her one day. We had walked three laps around a small pond, and I couldn't keep up with her. And mind you, she was a stage four breast cancer patient who'd been on chemo for several years. We sat down so that I could rest, and Nancy said, Your symptoms remind me of my neighbor who has dysautonomia. That was how I found a name that described the data I'd been collecting. I now had the grounds for a new conversation with my doctors. Armed with my data, tables, my graphs, my one lead EKG readings, and a tentative diagnosis, I went back to them. I knew more or less what was happening, and I had a plausible diagnosis. Maybe now, I hoped, 
we could figure out how to make things better. And indeed, we have. My self-collected data has helped my doctors see what I was experiencing in a real-life, real-time setting, not just in their blood draw labs or their contrived test settings. My primary care provider and my cardiologist both acknowledge that dysautonomia really does fit the symptoms that I've been describing and the symptoms that I have recorded on paper now. We haven't done any clinical testing yet until we can figure out which clinical tests are most likely to give us useful information. Meanwhile, on my own, I have discovered that if I consume salt and extra fluid around the time that I'm exerting myself, it can help mitigate some of these symptoms. And most important of all, perhaps, I am at peace knowing that I am now believed by the people to whom I entrust my medical care. I've become more convinced than ever of the need for active patient involvement in the creation and the maintenance of their own health records. First, patients should immediately be able to see, comment upon, and easily submit addenda or corrections if necessary to any and all information entered into their formal health records by medical personnel. Second, they should have the ability to gather real-time health data on themselves and make it part a part of their official clinical medical record, not just a part of the patient notes. That is my point here today. There's a growing trend for people to gather their own health information. What they need is a way that they can organize their real-time health data and make it a complementary important part of their clinic-derived health data. Real-time patient-generated data needs to be preserved by including it in the clinical data part of the electronic health record alongside the snapshot health data physicians typically get from their in-house lab tests and imaging. It needs to have all details available in the form of spreadsheets or quick visuals in graphs, and it needs to be as readily available and manipulable to patients as to physicians and other stakeholders. So what would be the payoff? Partnering with physicians to improve our health outcomes. The nature of the physician-patient relationship has changed a lot in the last 50 years, the nature of the relationship between patients and their health data is changing too. There's more patient demand for accessing and managing their electronic health records, and there's more patient demand for generating and using their own health data. All of this means a big opportunity. You might say, but, but why? Because a patient can add useful data as well as details about a particular health datum, like this happened after 10 minutes on an exercise bike, or this happened after I took X medication. Reason number two, patient can use the data to better manage their own health conditions. And reason number three, the patient can make sure that their care is coordinated among various physicians they may consult. In the U.S., there was a film that was very, very popular several years ago called Field of Dreams. In it, a man hears this voice in his head that tells him to build a baseball diamond out in the middle of his Iowa cornfield. He listens eventually to the voices and builds it. The voices say, if you build it, they will come. That's what I think is true about the kind of patient access to their own health records that we're talking about here. If you build it, they will come. Thank you.